I'm encouraged to be here. Man, man, man. I am um, so filled with joy to see you and to see what God is doing here. Three years. Amen. God has been and is and forever will be good. And I bless God and I, I pray, praise God for you all and for what he's doing in this body. Eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. God's doing amazing things here, and I, I bless God. If you have your devices, please take them out now and click on your Bible apps. Um, I'm being serious. Um, not angry birds, but meet me in Matthew chapter 18, and as you're turning there to Matthew chapter 18, let me just say how honored I am um, to be associated and affiliated with Pastor Albert Tate. Um, uh, I, I knew him um, when he was in his early 20s, and even then you could tell God's hand was on him. And uh, the wisest decision he ever made outside of saying yes to Jesus was to marry Sister LaRosa Tate. And uh, amen. amen, we bless God for her and then to his parents. And uh, uh, I've had the privilege of, yeah, one person, amen, grateful for the parents. No, we can, we can give it up for the parents. I've, uh, It is indeed a joy. I grew up in Atlanta in the 80s and early 90s. Because I grew up in Atlanta, I was, um, always had an affinity for the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets basketball team. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, this is when they were as good as it got. They had players like... Kenny Anderson and Travis Best, and head coach was Bobby Crimmins. They were phenomenal. Around the same time, I had a good friend of mine whose name was Ted McLeod. Ted was a phenomenal basketball player, and Ted shocked me and the rest of the crew when one day Ted said he was going to walk on to the Georgia Tech Yellow basketball team. Um, and joined their squad. We were looking at Ted like he was crazy, but sure enough, Ted started going to their basketball practices, and for the next couple of weeks, he wore what they wore and did what they did and took part in the drills, and, and he even impressed the head coach, Bobby Crimmins. Stellar defense, three-point range, I mean, Ted McLeod was phenomenal and defying all the odds. At the end of that tryout session, a couple of weeks, Coach Bobby Crimmins says to my boy, Ted McLeod, welcome to the team. You've made the team. I just got to do a few checks, but welcome. The next day, Bobby Crimmins came back and he wasn't too thrilled. He said, Ted, I got to put you off the team because my checks have revealed that you ain't a student. <laughs> Here for two weeks, Ted had been going to practice and was never enrolled in the university. For two weeks, he looked like a Georgia Tech Yellow Jacket basketball player. He was in the same environment as the Georgia Tech Yellow ja Jacket basketball team and did the same activities, but Crimmins had to say, depart from me, I never knew you. <laughs> There's a lot of people who are under the illusion of salvation, who do what Christians do, give money, who hang out in the same environment, We're incredibly philanthropic and generous. But the question on the table is, how do you really know you're saved? As my grandmama used to say, how do you show enough know you're saved? Jesus gives us one of the litmus tests, one of the indicator lights that that allows me to determine the authenticity of my Christianity. It's a hard subject, but it's a needed subject 
Because in Matthew chapter 18, this is the second time Jesus uses the term church. He only uses that word twice in all of his ministry. First time, Matthew 16, when he says, that's right, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Then two chapters later, the last time, the second time and last time, he uses the word church. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Don't call a prayer meeting under the guise of gossip. Don't do any of that stuff. Talk to him. Have relational courage. That doesn't work. Take two or three with you. If that doesn't work, he then says, take him before the church. Matthew chapter 18 is written under the assumption of relational dysfunction. Here's Jesus talking about church, and in talking about church that's filled with people who are, who are intrinsically sinful, Jesus assumes among the church, the people of God, that there will be mess. Jesus is not surprised by your sin. He's not surprised my, by my sin. The Holy Spirit doesn't peer over the balcony of heaven and elbow Jesus and say, can you believe that so-and-so gossip? No, the all-knowing one knows about our sin. The issue on the table is not the issue of sin, it's how do you navigate that and answer that question, particularly how do you navigate people who sin against you and you get one of the primary indicator lights that lets you know, again, as my grandmama Sylvia Lucinda Gray Loritz used to say, if you show enough saved. How do you handle people who wrong you? It's to this end that we turn now in verse 21. Under the context of church, it says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I, I don't say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, I went to Bible college to get out of math, and I, I, I believe that's 490 times. By the way, for those of you who are back there looking for a label for this message, a sermon title. I, I might title this one, The Most Difficult Math Problem in the World. Verse 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed, underline this, 10,000 talents. And since he couldn't pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Verse 27, underline it. This is really the classic theological premise for forgiveness. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant, here it is, released him, let it go, and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him, underline this phrase, a hundred denarii. Seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down, pleaded with him, have patience with me, I'll pay you. He refused, went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, are you kidding me? <laughs> Your translation doesn't say that. You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Verse 35 troubles me. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother, not, not with your mouth. I mean, that's easy, right? I mean, those who are parents, right? We, we, we got kids. Tell your brother sorry. <laughs> I got a 10-year-old son. Pray for me. 10-year-old son who thinks everything's a joke. I hope this isn't... I don't mean to be crass here, but he's just life of the party. He doesn't have a mean bone in his body. He just thinks everything's funny, so he, he relieves himself in a bottle and dumps it on his oldest brother's head. <laughs> Laughs. I said to his oldest brother, what did you do? Well, dad, I wanted to hit him, 
but I knew you'd get in trouble. I mean, I'd get in trouble with you. I said, let's go to Leviticus. <laughs> Jaden, tell your brother, sorry. Sorry. Quentin, what do you need to say? I ain't ready. <laughs> there are times kids go through the motion. That's not verse 35. He's not interested in our mouths. There's a sense in which I can control my mouth. What I can't control is my heart. So fundamentally, what Jesus is concerned with here is forgiveness is a heart issue. And if I can't control my heart, then the argument goes, then my inability to forgive could mean someone's not in my heart. The issue here is not forgive to get saved. That's work salvation. That's not the issue. We don't believe that. The issue here is a sign that you have received the vertical forgiveness of God is that you horizontally extend that to others. In other words, a Christian who holds a grudge is an oxymoron. His name was Charles Roberts IV. 32-year-old man who is disappointed with God. You know what disappointment is. It's when your real-time experiences do not align with your expectations. And the chasm between experiences and expectations, we call that disappointment. So here he is disappointed with God, and what he decides to do is he decides to take out his frustrations and disappointment on God by by going to the local God-fearing community called the Amish. His plan that day was simple. He wanted to beat and bind. If you need to give me a handheld, that's fine. He wanted to beat and bind. He wanted to beat and bind some of these Amish schoolhouse girls, sexually assault them, and then murder them. The end of that, he was going to pull the gun on himself and in an act of cowardice, take his own life. This is what he does. 32 years of age, he drives to the local Amish community, crisp fall afternoon, barges into the schoolhouse, takes out the duct tape, begins to bind 10 10-year-old girls. Praise God that in his sovereignty, the police immediately start to come. He hears the sirens. He's got to expedite his plans. He he doesn't sexually assault them. He takes out his gun and unloads round after round after round on them. Five of the, of the um, girls die instantaneously. The other five are rushed to the hospital, clinging for dear life. In the midst of it all, Charles Roberts IV has turned the gun on himself, taken his own life, and here we are, the global community. We are just stunned. What monster does this? At the same time, we began to hear that uh, the Amish didn't have any medical benefits in that community, and so we were concerned because five of these girls are now clinging for dear life, and their medical bills are rising and rising and rising, and they have no means to pay for it. And so in an astounding act of generosity, the global community gave in excess of $4.3 million over what they needed. So now the Amish elders have a conundrum on their hands. What do we do with the excess? So they call a meeting and they bounce ideas back and forth. What do we do with the excess 4.3 million? And in the middle of the meeting, one of the elders goes, well, what about the widow of Charles Roberts IV? We hear she has kids. Who's going to look after her? Immediately they vote and they marched over to her house and, and they give her a million dollars. Kiss her on the cheek. They say, we hold no grudge against you. CNN reporter saw this and was stunned by what he saw. He took his microphone, I'll never forget, and shoved it into this Amish elder's face. And with a, with a bit of, um, of, of sarcasm, he says, forgive, how can you forgive? Need I remind you what this woman's husband did to your daughters? How can you forgive? And I loved his response. Hear the simplicity of it. How can I forgive? I'm Christian. 
That's what Christians do. We forgive. If the insignia of the world is vengeance, then the badge of the believer is forgiveness. You want to know if you show enough saved? How do you handle folks who've wronged you? If you really want to know where you and Jesus are, what do you do when you've got one nerve left and that person is river dancing all over it? (laughs) What do you do with that individual who who hates your guts and goes out of their way to make life miserable for you, who if you were on fire and they had a cup of cold water, not only would they not throw it on you, but they would drink it slowly. Parenthesis. This message this morning has nothing to do with reconciliation. Reconciliation and forgiveness are similar, but they are not the same. Do not get it confused. You can forgive without reconciling, but you cannot be reconciled without forgiving. Forgiveness is a point. Reconciliation is a process. This message has nothing to do with um, uh, whether or not you and that friend uh, who stabbed you in your back should repair the friendship. This uh, message has nothing to do with whether or not that business partner who didn't uh, keep their end of the bargain, whether or not uh, you, should, um, you should pursue legal action or not. It has nothing to do with it. We, we, we can handle those issues differently, but what we are obligated to do in every circumstance is to forgive. In a crowd this size, if I were to pass the microphone around, and I were to ask the question, how have you been wronged in your life? All of us would have a testimony, would we not? All of us leasing time on God's green earth. We've been wounded. I could talk to you about my own wife, my beloved Corey with her fine self. Her daddy walked out on her, and her mama left for another woman. My wife was eight years old. About the age of nine, when the divorce was final, my beloved Corey, who looked at her dad as Superman, her dad would call and say, sweetheart, I'm coming on Friday night to pick you up at 6, and we're going to hang out for the weekend, pack your stuff. And my wife would excitedly pack her stuff and would sit there with her suitcase out on the front stoop with her baby doll, couldn't wait to find daddy. And daddy would, 6 o'clock would come, there's no daddy. 7 o'clock, no daddy. 8 o'clock, no daddy. 9 o'clock, no daddy. 10 o'clock at night. All the while, her mom keeps coming, saying, Corey, won't you come in the house? Because mom knows dad ain't showing up. But but something in my wife's heart just believed dad dad was going to be a man of his word. But at some point, she stopped waiting on dad, and this wounded thing happened to her. And There's a man here. I started to say a young man, but I remember preaching this message some weeks ago, and an old man came up to me, 80 years old. Said my wife, he said, my dad walked out on me and left me without a map to figure out manhood and life, and I've been mad at him for some 60 years. And he's been dead for some 60 years. And he said, I think tonight for the first time I'm going to write him a letter, put it on his grave. Tell him I forgive him. In a crowd this size, someone here, you were sexually abused. The apex of your innocence. That neighbor, that that uncle, that person. Pilfered you of your innocence. 
You've been free falling, it seems like, ever since. Someone else, you were fresh to that university. One of your first dates, you were date raped. You don't know how to handle that. Others of you, it, it may not be as traumatic, but it's, it's the little irritants, and, and it's, that, it's that nagging in-law. And you done told them about 20 times. And they just seem to show no regard for you or your household. Jesus said it this way, what credit is it to you if you love the lovable? Even the Gentiles do that. It's when you love the unlovable. As we come to our text today, we learn three things about forgiveness. Here's Peter, and I love Peter. As our text opens up, Peter in verse 21, his mind is still stuck on verse 15 because uh, round about verse 15, Jesus says, look, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now in verse 21, uh, Peter comes to Jesus. and not, Now how many times? I love Peter. How many times will my brother sin against me and I tell him his fault? And, and, and I love Peter. He doesn't wait for Jesus to answer. He offers his own answer. Seven times? Now, Peter has to be smiling as he's saying this because you have to understand that in Peter's day, the rabbis actually taught, you only need to forgive three times. You only had to give three mulligans. So here's Peter. He takes the number three, multiplies it times two. He doubles it, adds one for good measure to land on the number of completion. And he says to Jesus, seven times. And Jesus, in his typical way, takes out his needle and bursts Peter's balloon. He says to him, I do not say to you seven times, Peter, but 70 times seven. Some of you are going, that's 490 times. Man, this person, they on 489. Praise <laughs> God. You have to understand, and you get this, Jesus is not being literal here. He's employing a literary device called hyperbole. The idea of hyperbole, it simply is the idea of exaggeration in order to make a point. His point is, is that forgiveness is to be unending. For those of us who are followers of the way... We should not keep score with others because thank God that God in Christ has not kept score with us. Now right on the heels of this, Jesus tells a story. And in this story, we learn three vital lessons of forgiveness. He paints the picture of an individual who's locked up in jail because he cannot pay his debt. And his debt is 10,000 talents. Now, I wanted you to underline this phrase, 10,000 talents, because we Americans living in 2015, we don't get this phrase. You need to understand this. One talent in Jesus' day was worth about 15 years' worth of wages. This man owes 10,000 talents. One commentator said it this way. He said the annual debt for the region of Galilee in Jesus' day was 300 talents. This man owes 10,000. Another commentator said it this way. What this man owes is the equivalent of putting all of America's debt on one person. He owes 10,000 talents. It is a bill he cannot pay. He then says to Jesus, please be patient with me, or rather to the king, please be patient with me, and I will pay you what you owe. Really? If I had more time, I'd say that's the foolishness of work salvation. This whole notion that we can pay off a debt owed to God. He owes 10,000 talents. Verse 27 says, out of pity for him, his master released him. If you're looking for a good definition of forgiveness, there it is. It is a releasing. It is a letting go. He lets him go. 
three things I want to teach you about forgiveness. Number one, forgiveness is always irrational. If it doesn't have a little crazy to it, it ain't forgiveness. I, I get it, King. You can't get back all your 10,000 talents, but you can get something back to let it go, to let the whole bill go. It doesn't make sense. But that's forgiveness. If there's not a sense in which your girlfriends go, are, are you serious? It probably ain't forgiveness. Is this a safe place? Now, if you've got black church tendencies, this is the, your opportunity to talk to me. Is this a safe place? <laughs> I love mafia movies. Yeah, see, some of y'all judging me right now. And now, I, I shouldn't love mafia movies, especially as a black man, because if you've ever seen a mafia movie with a black person in it, you know he's got about two minutes of screen time, <laughs> and he's dead. Right? Have you ever saw Goodfellas with Samuel Jackson? I mean, you know, 90 seconds, boom, he was dead. Some of y'all are like, I can't believe you gave it away. It came out in 1990, all right? Give me a break. But anyways, there's a great movie called The Untouchables. Kevin Costner. Oh, oh y'all want to amen now. Y'all were just judging me. <laughs> And now you want to amen me, right? 1987, Kevin Costner, Sean Connery. And in this movie, as Kevin Costner and Sean Connery, they're about to raid Al Capone's safe house. And right before they raid it, Sean Connery stops Kevin Costner. He says, look, we're about to raid his safe house. Let's get some things straight. If they pull a knife out on us, we got to pull a gun out on them. If they send one of ours to the hospital, we got to send one of theirs to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. <laughs> Tit for tat. Back and forth, you don't let it go, you up the ante. That's how many of us function when someone's wronged us. Now, now, now don't get me wrong. Please hear me. Some of us are way too sophisticated when we've been wrong to let the other person know that we're hurt. So instead, what we do is we begin to what I call emotionally moonwalk. It's that wife who's been wronged by the husband, and all she says is, oh, okay, okay. Men, if you've done something and you're like, my wife should be going crazy, and all she's saying is, okay. Get a hotel. And pray she can't cook grits. All the chocolate people are laughing at that. Grits, what's, what's, what's the, with the grits reference? Um, so what happens is, what, what, what happens is you wrong me and I'm way too cool to let you see that I'm hurt. So before the incident, I may have been quick to return the text message or call, but all of a sudden I've gotten busy. And I set up a wall and I assassinate the friendship, and I put up a barrier, and I start distancing myself. In 1995, there was a great movie that came out called Braveheart. That brother ain't never said amen in church before. But in the movie Braveheart, here's William Wallace. He's been wrong. The English take his wife, man. It's, it's brutal. They end up murdering uh, his, his wife, and it's just rough, and it's difficult. And what does he do? He gets an army, and he goes to war, and he exacts vengeance. And let me show us our hearts. At, at no point when you were watching Braveheart did you go, William, let it go. <laughs> there is within the fallen human heart this thing of... You pull a knife out on me, I pull a gun out on you. You send one of mine to the hospital, I send one of yours to the morgue. The Chicago way lives in all of us. What's rational is to keep score. What's irrational is to let it go. 
Second thing I want to show you about forgiveness is forgiveness is not only irrational, it's costly. Now again, I get, King, you can't get 10,000 talents back, but now you can get something back. And to just let it go means it literally costs you some money. You're out of money. It was Tim Keller who said forgiveness is a suffering. What does he mean by that? What he means is you do something to me, my, my natural reaction is to get you back. I want to inflict suffering on you. But for me to let it go does not inflict suffering on you, it inflicts suffering on me. But for me to let it go and inflict suffering on me puts me now in the company of Jesus, who while on the cross said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. <laughs> to forgive should hurt. It should hurt your ego. It should hurt your pride. Corrie ten Boom, many of us don't know that name, but we should know that name. Corrie ten Boom, um, she spent many, many years in a Nazi concentration camp, not because she was Jewish, but because her family harbored Jews. While in that Nazi concentration camp, she witnessed her sister being brutally murdered by one of the Nazi guards there. Corrie ten Boom survives the Nazi concentration camp. She's then released. Upon being released, she then, years later, begins to preach at a church. As she's preaching at this church this one Sunday, after she's finished, she's shaking hands, and she notices a man walking down the aisle saying, Corey, Corey, do you remember me? It was the man who murdered her sister. Corey, Corey, he says, I am a Christian now. Will you forgive me? Listen to what she says. I, I, I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. So get the picture. Man's coming. Will you forgive me? So she's praying silently. Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. Did you get that? She don't feel like forgiving. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one outstretched to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. Hear it. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Did you get what she said? I don't feel like it. But I'm going to do it anyways. I don't feel it, but I'm going to act in faith. When she acted in faith, then the feelings came. If you're waiting to forgive only when you feel like it, you'll never get there. In fact, you need to know that when going through life's trying times, always let what you know trump how you feel. Forgiveness is irrational, it's costly, but finally it's freeing. Notice what happens when this man is forgiven, he's let out of jail. Then he goes and finds someone who owes 100 denarii. You know, you know what that is? It's a couple bucks. He's been forgiven America's debt, and now he starts tripping over an In-N-Out burger. <laughs> so let me get this straight. God's forgiven you of every single time you've looked at porn. L let me get this straight. God's forgiven you of every lie you have told, are telling, and will tell. God's forgiven you of the greed. God's forgiven you of the betrayal. And you can't forgive her because she gossiped about you? Pay what you owe. The master hears about this, throws him in jail. His refusal to forgive gets him incarcerated. Corey and I, we, um, we've got an alarm system at our house. 
Every single night when Corey and I go to bed, I, I go to the little trackpad there, and like in your house, I'll key in the code, and then I'll punch in a button called stay. When I key in this button called stay, two things happen. Alarm clock, the alarm is enabled, and those on the outside can't get close to us on the inside without tripping up the alarm. They're held at a distance. But at the same time, when I key in the code and punch the word stay, those of us on the inside can't get out without, dis- without tripping up the alarm. We're trapped. Pastor Tate, I've been pastoring enough to always spot a person with forgiveness issues. They do people like this. Can't get close to them. Never really get a chance to know them. It's got many different masks. For some people, it's constant humor and sarcasm. And ain't nothing wrong being funny. Be funny is great. But, but, but some people use humor as a defense mechanism. I'll keep you laughing so you'll never have to get to know me. Uh, other people, there's no joy there. There's biting negativity. Other people, you'll get so far with them, and then all of a sudden, they'll say, you've gotten too close time to tuck tail and run. At some point, for someone here, something happened to you, and you clicked stay on the alarm pad of your heart, and you said never again. As we close, I was almost filled with tears this morning, just driving down the, fe- the, the freeway. It, it just, being in California, man, it's just, it's just, December 1995, it's hard to believe, almost 20 years ago, I loaded up my little Nissan Sentra, drove down I-20, came out here, and I started working for my pastor, Bishop Kenneth Homer, Faithful Central Bible Church, absolutely loved it, and I was glad to be there because when I was in Bible college, uh, just a couple years before, um, one of my conservative white evangelical classmates called me the N-word. And I said, you know what, white people are tripping, I wouldn't be around them again. Long story short, I'm just done. I'm just done. So I get to this 13,000 person chocolate church. I'm in heaven, don't have to be around white people no more. I'm just going to do my thing, and it's great, and I'm having a ball. Ain't got to interpret nothing. I can just be me. I ain't never going to be around white people again. Well, 1998. A little storefront church down the way called Lake Avenue came after me and first African-American pastor to come on staff in their 100 plus year history. God loves it when you tell him what you will and won't do with your life. So I leave the chocolate church to walk into the vanilla church and I... I walked up into Lake Avenue like, like Jonah walked into Nineveh. I'm going to tell these folks about themselves and boop, 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 boop. I'll never forget one Sunday, turning point in my life, man. My African-American buddies, they, 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 they came from Faithful Central just to hear me preach. And we went out to lunch afterwards, and they read me the riot act. They said, we don't know this guy. So for 45 minutes, we watched you beat the people up. There's no love there, no joy. We don't know you. There's a meanness. There's an edge. And that night I fell on my face in my little apartment there on Los Robles, man, and just cried out to God. Here's the crazy maker. You know what the crazy maker of unforgiveness is? Some 10 years before, I had allowed one individual in one episode to alter my personality. I gave one person a power over my life that only the Holy Spirit should have. And that person wasn't even thinking about me. Unforgiveness is counterintuitive. We think it'll hurt the other, when in reality, it's what poisons us. 
That's why the greatest gift you can ever give yourself is the gift of forgiveness. The Holy Spirit's been talking to somebody. If you're sitting here and you're going, I got forgiveness issues and I need prayer. I'd love to pray for you. If you're saying, I I need help letting this thing go, Pastor, would you pray for me? Would you just stand to your feet? I, I, I got a forgiveness issue in my life. I don't need to know what that issue is. Don't need to know what you need to let go. But Fellowship Monrovia can never be the church out there until we can learn how to relate to one another in here and let it go. You only get so far with God. God said it this way. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way so that your prayers may not be hindered. That blesses me, not just for its immediate context, but what God seems to be saying. You and, you and I vertically ain't right. if you ain't horizontally right with others. Jesus said it this way. If, if when you're at the altar, worshiping God, and you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar, cut your worship short, make it right. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I don't come, Lord God, as an individual pointing the finger at someone else. No, I come as a fellow wounded traveler. But what what little kids say to each other, I can say right now, it takes one to know one. I know what it's like to be wronged. I know what it's like, Lord God, to, to trust and be betrayed. So I stand with these, your children and my siblings in the kingdom. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I I just ask, Lord God, that you would give us the strength to, by faith, say some of the three most powerful words that the human being can utter, I forgive you. Uh, God, I don't, I don't know how that, 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 I don't know what that looks like in our life, Lord God. You, you may want us this week to set up an appointment and to sit down over a cup of coffee and or you may want us to send the text message or the email, Lord God. We're open to, to the format of it, Lord God, but I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that we would be real enough to say, I don't feel it, but by faith, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to let what I know to trump how I feel. I pray, Lord God, for reconciliation. I'd love for that to happen, Lord God. I'd I'd love for old friendships to get patched back up. I'd love for father and son relationship or mother-daughter relationships or whatever it may look like to get restored. But that's not the issue. I pray in the name of Jesus that, that we would leave here today, Lord God, feeling that our souls just lost about 100 pounds. We feel lighter. We feel free because we're letting it go. I pray, Lord God, that where there has been bitterness and negativity, that you would restore unto us the joy of our salvation. I pray that our countenance would literally change because we've let it go. We've let it go. Lord, I love this church. I stand celebrating all that she's done. 
And I pray for greater degrees of ministry and effectiveness and baptisms and folks come to know the Savior, Lord God. But I pray that we would be faithful to one another, that when we wrong each other, that we'd let it go and we'd forgive and forgive and forgive. 70 times seven, the most difficult math problem in the world. In Jesus' name, amen.